this film now will have that same impact a hundred, a thousand fold with tens of millions of people and especially young people being inspired by what I think is the single most inspiring story that I have heard, so Jose, on behalf of the entire University of the Pacific community. I hope this doesn't sound too corny, but we are unbelievably proud of you. Hold on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm so glad so many of our students here today. Thank you guys for coming. So, <clears throat> a little overwhelming. Uh, you have a, a, a now major motion picture uh, about you. Tell us a little bit about the process. How involved were you in the making of it? Um, and and what, was that, what was that like? Well, it was interesting um, in a sense that, you know, when I, um, first of all, when I wanted to be an astronaut and I was growing up, it wasn't a goal for me. The goal wasn't, hey, I hope one day they make a movie about my life story. <laughs> and let's be clear about that. That was not the goal. Um, the goal was uh, purely selfish reason. I wanted to go to space. And then um, when I did get selected, I, um, I got all this attention because I was the first migrant farm worker to become an astronaut. And so I realized I became an uh, instant uh, role model. Uh, and the magnifying glass was, was on me. And I embraced it. I embraced it, uh, you know, soon became NASA's poster child. Uh, when it came to go and talk to kids and everything, and uh, they, you know, the first person they thought of, hey, let's send Jose and uh, let him talk. So I, I did that and I embraced it. And then I left NASA, and for some reason or another, people paid me to give talks. <laughs> uh, it was, it's a pretty good living, and I, you know, <laughs> giving talks. And, and so I, you know, I gave motivational talks, and I started motivating people. and. Uh, then they approached me and said, you know, you should write a book about your story. And I did, and we published it, and I gave more talks. Then mothers came to me and said, you should write this story for a kid that's seven or eight years old that could understand it. So I wrote a children's bilingual book, The Boy Who Touched the Stars. And then the publisher comes to me and says, okay, you got the adult self pen biography, you got the children's book, we need the middle reader. <laughs> I said, oh, great, how many times can I tell my story? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and so I, the way I tell that story is, um, you know, the biography is, is chronological from little to getting selected as an astronaut. The middle reader, I take him on that 14 day journey to space so they get an idea of what a space mission's like. But, you know, I have flashbacks and unknowingly un, uh, to the middle reader, I feed them anecdotes that's going to, you know, give them the tools pretty much the way I do it with my self pen biography. So that was a chance to reach tens of thousands and not hundreds of thousands of people on that. And then I started getting overtures about, hey, we ought to do a movie about you. And I was, um, you know, I had read very uh, stories Nightmare stories where you sign away your life rights and they get tied up and nothing ever happens. And I said, you know, I'm gonna, not going to sign up with the first production house that comes. You know, none were brick and mortar. Some of them didn't have the pedigree. And it wasn't until select films came to me and said, look, we, you don't have to sign your life rights to us. You know, let's work as a team and let's pitch your idea to the studios. And uh, their pedigree was they did McFarland USA. Uh, they did Secretariat, Million Dollar Armed, a rookie. So they specialize in, in, in uh, motivational films. And I said, you know, this is the perfect film house to do it. And so I went with them on the road. We pitched to uh, like six studios, and five of them said yes. You know, and then so, so then, you know, the rest is history. We just started filming. Um, the writer, um, you know, she came to my house, the very first uh, writer came to my house, spent a few days with us, 
and uh, you know, uh, we lost her. She was battling cancer, so she rests in peace. And so then uh, Hernan Jimenez took over the writing, and uh, I talked to him a lot over the phone. And then finally, the third iteration of the writing of the script was with the director, Alejandra Marquez Abella. She came over to spent time with my family, with my parents, and uh, and so she got the gist of it. And to me, it was very important that um, that the story wasn't about me, 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 but rather that it was a you know effort from the family. You know, you saw how uh, you know my my wife was very supportive and continues to be so. Uh, my parents, everybody, and so I wanted to make sure that that was reflected. And I also wanted to make sure <coughs> that the struggles. Um, as a professional or going to college, you know, that kids realize that, you know, even, even as a professional, even as an astronaut, you know, the imposter syndrome exists. It's alive and well. And that you, you got to believe in yourself. And, and so that was what I try to kind of project in the, in the yeah. film. And I try to get across the director, Alejandra Marquez Abello, to make sure she put in the film. And I think she did an outstanding, an outstanding job in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. <laughs> Jose, there, there were so many um, emotional parts of, of, of the film. Um, what, was, what, what got to you the most? What was, what's the one scene in that beautiful film that really, really hits home for you, that, that, that tugs at your heartstrings? Uh, you know, it, it was, you know, when they tell stories um, and they tell a life story, it's hard to put everything uh, in a two-hour time span to fit a whole life. In a, and so they do a lot of, um, you know, combining of characters. Like Beto is a combination of three uh, childhood friends of mine. And, um, and they play around with the timelines a bit. But I'll tell you, I think the most important one, the very pivotal one, was um, when I got rejected for the sixth time and I was ready to give up. You know, I had crunched up the paper and I threw it on the floor and, uh, you know, I was in my mind, hey, I'm not going to apply anymore, you know, six rejections. And my wife found a rejection letter and, uh, and you know, she put two and two together and she says, this guy's giving up on me. And she catered to my ego uh, when she approached me and said, what's this? And, you know, I thought I was going to get, you know, this was an opportunity to get spoiled from her. Maybe she'll give me a cup of hot chocolate, make me feel better, you know, to say there, there, everything's going to be okay. So I gave her my sob story. Hey, NASA, sixth time I'm reject. I think I'm going to stop applying because it's a silly dream. And she looked at me and she says, so you're a quitter. You know, those were fighting words. You know, she catered to my ego, and I said, no, I'm not a quitter. I said, you know, look, it's clear NASA doesn't want me. It's six rejections. And she said, I agree. She, I agree they don't want you this year, and they don't want you, they didn't want you the previous years. I said, but read the last line of the rejection letter. And I said, and the last line said, please feel free to reapply at the next selection round. I said, they're not telling you don't ever apply again. And, and if you don't apply, she, sa she said, I know you. You're going to have that warm up curiosity in you, wondering what if. And that warm up curiosity is going to eat at you, eat at you, and you're going to grow up to be a bitter old man. And I don't want to be married to a bitter old man. <laughs> so you better think about it. And, uh, and, and so, so she walked away, but her parting words were, I don't know what they have that you don't have. And that stuck with me. And I said, I don't know either. Maybe I should find out. And that's when I found out that they were all pilots and I wasn't a pilot. That's when I found out that they, most of them were scuba dive rated. I wasn't scuba dive rated. And that's when I found out that uh, most of them had a third language. And so, you know, I conferred with my wife. I said, hey, this is what I found out. And, uh, and, I, and she said, well, let's do it. I said, but how about your restaurant? I said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. That, that can wait. Let's, let's, let's chase your dream first. And, and so that's, I think that's the, 
the pivotal moment in me becoming an astronaut, but in <laughs> in terms of support, that yeah. was yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Jose. We we have with us tonight is, is lots of different folks in the audience, um, but um, the most important ones, as always, uh, are our students. Sure. And we have uh, we have some of our. Um, uh, students from our School of Engineering and Computer Science, and we have students and Dean Orwin from our and Dean Orwin is here, yes. and and we have students from our commu uh, community involvement program, CIT yes. program, program I graduated is, from. And for those of you, <laughs> such, such an important part of Pacific's history of Stockton, uh, being able to give young people, first generation college students, the opportunity to come here. Talk to them. What do you want to? What do you want them? What do you want them to know? Well, I, it's it's to me. I just want them to uh, make sure you believe in yourselves. Uh, you know, there's times, especially when I was uh, when I first started college here. I came in as a freshman, not a transfer student, and uh, you know that I was a good student at Franklin High School in Stockton, East Side Stockton. <laughs> but even so. Even so, you know, I was taking calculus, physics, uh, chemistry, uh, and, you know, a humanities class. And that's, that's when I found out that not all public high schools are created evenly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, I had some catching up to do. And it, it was tough, uh, you know, especially that freshman year of trying to get through. And I even quite honestly thought about dropping out. Because I said, maybe I don't have the right stuff to graduate and to be an engineer. And you know, all I could think of is, uh, you know, the sacrifice your parents made. And, you know, that monarch butterfly is such a powerful um, representation of, you know, what your parents do. In the sense that, you know, the butterfly comes from Canada, ends up in Michoacan. Uh, but it's not that same butterfly, it's generations of butterflies that eventually make it there on the migration and it's generations that, that go back to Canada. And that's what our parents have been doing. I mean, they came from Mexico. Uh, that's one generation of monarch butterflies. You know, I came to college, that's another generation. I got a master's degree. Uh, then you got my son here, Julio, you know, third generation. You know, he's got, a, he's got a PhD in aerospace engineering in Purdue. And why Purdue? Because, you know, Purdue has produced the most astronauts than any other university. So I guess I know what he wants to be when he grows up, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but th my, my point to all of you is that, you know, it's okay to have self-doubt. It's okay to second-guess yourself. But when, when uh, the uh, rubber hits the road, you know, you just got to get in there and do the work. There's no shortcuts. It's like form study groups. Uh, get that tutoring from student support services. Uh, professors have office hours. Use them. They're being paid for that. You know, they're happy when they go there and there's no student. The heck with that. Put them to work. You be there. <laughs> you know? And, and that's what you got to do. That's wonderful. Jose, tell us a little bit about your Pacific experience and and obviously we saw a lot we saw wonderful so I saw Scott Biederman had several tears in his eyes during the movie every time um, uh, uh, something Pacific came on the uh, came on the screen which was wonderful um, one little funny story which I think you will tell us and then and then and then I'd love to hear more mm -hmm. about your Pacific experience but first of all um, the actor um, was wearing a Pacific shirt yes. but I think some people noticed well, where did that shirt come from so that was it had to be specially made. Yeah, why, yeah. Why, 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 why? I'll tell you why, why I think. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Scott Biederman, you know, I said, hey, we need some shirts, and he's, I'll get them to you. And uh, I said, they're filming right now. They need them like ASAP. So, said, okay, I'll get them to you. What size? I said, I don't know. Let me, let me call up the, uh, the director and, and have him ask, uh, have her ask Michael Pena. And I, and I told my, and, you know, and the director comes and says, oh, he wants a large. And I, I said, okay, large? Okay, he, so he's like me then. I said, yeah, he's large. And I guess they're like, you know, um, uh, Scott gave me like three or four versions and we shipped them off there. And 
Uh, he didn't wear them for some reason, and my guess is that they were probably too short, too small for him. I can't verify I'm, that. I, I think that. I will. can't verify that, and uh, and so I think they what they did is they made their own design. But yeah. um, my recommendation is that we ought to copy that design and say this is from the movie. I I, I, and, I, 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 and I use see it. Scott's, now, Scott's no, taking a note back there. Yeah. Though, so, so, yeah. Now, now you know. Michael, uh, you know, I have met him several occasions, and uh, he's a great guy, and he's a good actor, and everybody says, what do you think about Michael be playing you? I said, you know, that's the person I recommended, because I loved him on The Martian and everything. I said, um, I said, you know, he's not as good looking as me, but he's a good actor. <laughs> but he's a good actor, and so, uh, so, so, so I was tickled to death that, uh, that he got it, and then Rosa Salazar, uh, you know, she, she has played uh, Lita, Battlestar Angel, uh, has starred in her own movie and uh, with James Cameron, I think, directing it. And so she, by her own right, is a, a solid actress and uh, she, she, she played my wife to the, to the teeth. I mean, she, she nailed my wife because that, how you see there, that's, that's my wife, including the, the, you know, the sense of humor and everything of how she uh, behaves, uh, that's, that's her. Wonderful, wonderful. Tell us about your Pacific experience and, and, oh, the and how that helped on your journey. The Pacific experience, uh, it was a great experience. You know, I, I never had the opportunity of living on campus because you were always looking at saving money. And, and so yeah, I drove from East Side Stockton over here and, uh, and you know, that car that you see there, I mean, it, that's how it was, a 64 Chevy Impala. Uh, it didn't have monarch butterflies, it had roses on the side, pinstripe roses. And uh, it stood out like a sore thumb here. Uh, but, it, you know, but, you know, that got me from point A to point B. And, uh, and, and, and then, um, you know, working, uh, basically uh, studying here and doing work study. I worked at the high school equivalency program, so I tutored kids um, that were trying to get their high school equivalency certificate. Uh, but but I'll tell you you know the I love the fact that uh, this was a, a student uh, centered type of campus where you know it wasn't about research but it was about the students learning uh, you know I forge great relationships with uh, with folks here uh, you know my physics professor uh, Dr. Andres Rodriguez uh, may he rest in peace you know, he was a great professor, a great physics professor that, uh, that helped me through some tough times. And, and so that's the beauty of having a small campus is that the professors get to know the students and uh, they take a special interest. And if you're willing to work hard, you're going to do very well here. And, uh, and it's a great experience. It's a small university where you get to know your peers and you you basically form lifelong relationships, not only with your peers, but with your professors and the staff that's here. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite place on campus? My favorite place on campus, um, I think it, it was uh, Curry Hall when uh, I used to go upstairs and study, because it was a great place that no one knew that you, know, uh, that you can go up, up there and hide away and study. So it was good. Well, you'll be delighted to know is it exactly how you left it. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so you can, you know, we rekindle old memories. So that'd be, yeah. that'd be, that'd be we, great. We, we need to get the curries to donate <laughs> another building. <laughs> Jose, how, how does your, your, your NASA experience, your space experience, how does that inform your thinking today? I mean, you, you've done something that very, very, very few people have had the opportunity to do. What, what, what did you take away from that into your, your day to day life? Well, what I take away from that is, is um, that, you know, there's a lot of people that work towards a common goal. And, uh, and so when we're training and we're getting ready for a mission or we're on a mission, you know, there's seven of us on the rocket and we get the focus of attention. Yet, there's tens of thousands of people at NASA that's making that moment possible. And so it's like the movie said, and it's like my father said, you know, even if you're the janitor at NASA, what's wrong with that? There's nothing. You take pride in what you do and you're the best at doing it. And so what I took away from 
from my work at NASA is that every little piece of the puzzle is important. And everyone's important in making sure that they put the puzzle in the right place. And so uh, it's all about teamwork. It's all about camaraderie. It's all about depending on each other. So that's very important. Wonderful. Tell us, I, I, some few people know, but others might not know. T tell us about the um, uh, Jose Hernandez Reaching for the Stars. Oh, yes. Uh, very proud of yeah. that foundation. Uh, you know, we started it uh, back in 2006, shortly after I got selected. And, uh, and we, we uh, basically, it's called the Jose Hernandez Reaching for the Star Foundation. And, uh, and we basically do several, um, several activities, but it's designed to, uh, to encourage our youngsters in the Central Valley to consider careers in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, I'll tell you one of the, uh, we have several programs. The first program we have is we have a science blast where you know, we, uh, we work with the SHIP students this past year with Dean Orwin. And, uh, and you know, we had over 750 uh, fifth graders uh, to spend a day on, a, so they could have a hands-on exploratory experience designed to wake up their scientific curiosity. Why fifth grade? Uh, fifth graders are 10 years old. How old was I when I wanted to be an astronaut? 10 years old, so it's no accident. We picked that by design. And then, uh, and then what we've been working on now is, uh, is, is we have a uh, summer academy where we work with Pacific, and we started that and basically handed it over to Pacific, and we still help them with that. But I'll tell you, this uh, summer academy takes seventh graders through 12th graders, and they spend five weeks on the Pacific campus and also on the Sacramento campus that we just started as well. And, uh, and there we basically expose them to next year's core curriculum in math and science. And I'll tell you the, uh, the one person I really want to thank, I call him the godfather of that summer academy, is, is, is uh, Mr. Zuckerman here, Tom Zuckerman. Because uh, when I first had that thought, um, I had seen Text Prep USA in Texas and I modeled this program after text prep, and I, I flew in the, 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 the coordinator program, coordinator of mm -hmm. that program, and you know, I bent the ear of, of, of Mr. Zuckerman. Uh, at the time I was a regent, he was a regent, and I bent his ear, and you know, he kind of wrote the first $25,000 check to get that program started. So, uh, so he's, the, Wonderful. he's the grandpa, so he deserves a lot of, recognition for, for being the catalyst and starting that program because without him I don't think the program would have started and we've helped hundreds of kids going through that program and we got to keep it going so. Well that, that program is just one more example of Jose's uh, legacy uh, uh, here in, in the Central Valley and here at Pacific and I will tell you and, and, and my Dean Orwin and, and my other colleagues here know uh, uh, Jose is, is exactly one phone call away. Anytime we call and say, hey, Jose, can you come to campus and talk to this group of students or whatever it happens to be, he is always, always there. And that notion of, of giving back uh, yes, and being part of this community, we will, uh, we are both very appreciative of. Something the Community Involvement Program taught me. Yes, well, it is. And it, is, and it is something that we will never um, uh, take for granted. We're very appreciative. We're very appreciative of tonight. Um, we're going to wrap this up now only because there's another group of students that we want to run over and, sure. and, 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 uh, and make sure they have the opportunity to say hi to Jose. So we're going to wrap this up now. Thank you all for being here. Jose, thank you for making thank this you. very special night possible. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Appreciate it. <laughs>